Hello, everyone, and welcome to Soleil Spaces Short Film Saturday. We are so excited today because it is March 5th, and this is the first Saturday of March, meaning it is International Women's History Month. And how are we kicking that off? With two amazing female filmmakers. Here we have Mina Migoto and Yuko Torihara, both Japanese filmmakers with super awesome documentaries for us today. We are Soleil Space. Our mission, super simple, super easy, is to achieve a more equitable Hello, and representative. Everyone, and welcome oh, to nice. Soleil Space's short film. Saturday, we are so, so somebody has their YouTube. Um, it is international. <laughs> you goes at you. No worries, no worries. So just make sure that your YouTube is on uh, whichever tab as YouTube is on mute. Good. <laughs> no worries, no worries, no worries. It happens. This is the technical age and we are all still getting used to it. <laughs> so well, a little bit more about Soleil. Our focus is on the global diasporas of Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean with the goals of elevating these untold stories from these cultures, forming closer transcultural community bonds and providing opportunities and resources for our creators to produce premium world-class content. So we specialize in long form scripted and documentary film and television, branded and short film digital content. But today is all about the short films, okay? We aim to lift up underrepresented voices and there is no no better way to do that than ta -da, through these short films. Shorts are often the purest form of artistic expression and often, not always, executed within boundaries of smaller production bu budgets. What does that mean? A little more equitable, a little more open to everybody. So we love exploring those. So let's take a look at our two super cool filmmakers. First, we have Minami Goto. She's a Japanese filmmaker, like I said. She has a BA in art history from the University of Tokyo. Dancing, where she produced a series of film screenings and events. She obtained her Master's of Fine Arts at Columbia University in New York. Okay, fancy. With the help of three scholarships, she has an extensive experience working with international crews and is directed, written, and produced a number of short films in both the U.S. and Japan. Minami won the AVEX Digital Award for Best Script and Pitch at the Short Shorts Film Festival in Asia in 2017. She also won the Jack Larson Award for collaboration in the same year. In 2020, Minami participated in the Kyoto Filmmakers Lab 2020 and the Butian International Fantastic Film Festival's Fantastic Film School 2020. That was a busy year for you. These days, she works from her home in Tokyo, Kyoto, and in Shizuoka. So everyone, give a warm welcome to Minami. I know we can't hear you guys, but I know you're clapping there. And next, we have Yuko Torihara, also from Tokyo. She is a NYC-based filmmaker, actress, photographer, producer. She grew up living between Japan, the UK, and the US with a BA in Comparative Literature and Literary Theory from the University of Pennsylvania. She's the former assistant to screenwriter and director Paul Haggis. In 2012, she co-opted the New York office of the Brazilian production studio, Santa Transmedia, where she produced animation and artist-led brand content collaborations for a range of clients. Yuko began making films in 2010 with her first narrative short, Amaterasu, shot in the Niigata prefecture of Japan. That was screened the new filmmakers anthology series in NYC, Uplink, and Torpedo Art Center. She's currently working on her first documentary film, which you know we're going to be chatting about. So let's give a round of applause for Yuko. So check it out. Here's how today is going to go. Um, we're going to have both the filmmakers introduce their films in one second, tell you a little bit about them, and then we're going to go ahead and watch them. After that, stick around because we're doing an awesome Q&A. We're going to be talking with both these amazing filmmakers about their super funky documentaries. And after I ask them all of my amazingly written questions, we're going to open up the floor to audience questions. And I know after you see these documentaries, you're all going to have a million questions. So stick around, ask those questions. We're going to get to hear from the filmmakers. Do not forget to like and subscribe, right? This is YouTube, y'all know how it goes. So go ahead, uh, Minami, since I introduced you first, I'll let you go first. Tell us a little bit about your film. Hey, hi everyone, I'm Minami. I'm the director of, of short documentary film, Shadow Piece. Um, it is about a documentary about um, legendary artist, uh, Mieko Shiomi, who participated in um, 
art movement, uh, which is named Fluxus in 1960s New York City. And I met her and I asked her about how she overcome the adversity as living as, living as a female artist, like a female Asian artist, but actually she um, expresses anti-feminist views and that led me to embark on a journey to learn more about her and also myself. And it's like 10 minutes film. I hope everyone enjoy. Awesome, awesome. And you could go ahead, tell us about your film. Great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, my film is called, uh, called Chinatown Beat. Um, I made it in uh, the winter of 2020, um, a little bit, uh, yeah, last year, maybe January, something like that. Um, and it's a film that just kind of formed itself. It was like a whirlwind project. Um, and I approached one person uh, who's a writer, crime novelist, um, Henry Chang. Um, and from there, it just, the people showed up and we just made this community piece that was um, sort of part documentary, part uh, hybrid um, depiction of, um, what it means to be Asian um, in the media. Um, so we all play different roles, and it's it's a it's a it's a short little piece, five four or five minutes long. Um, that's about New York City and Chinatown. So hope you I, enjoy. Love, I love that you call it a community piece. I think when people watch it, they're really going to see that. So. You, you have me wanting to ask questions already. We can't do that yet. We are about to watch the films, everyone. Stick around. Let's go ahead and check out these amazing documentaries. Okay, everyone. We are back. We are back. We are back. Whoa, those are some really cool films. If you're just joining us, let me let you know what's going on. We are here with Minami Goto and Yuko Torihara, two amazing Japanese uh, filmmakers. We just watched each of their documentaries. We had Shadow Piece for Minami Goto and Chinatown Beat for Yuko Torihara. And you guys know what it is. Now we are starting the Q and a, um, I have a lot of questions. I can already see from the comments that our viewers have quite a few questions. So audience members, if you guys have questions, hold on to them. Don't submit them in the chat just yet because I won't be able to check it. After I'm done asking my questions, I'll ask uh, you guys to go ahead and submit yours and then we'll get to ask um, the filmmakers um, your questions as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and start with you, Minami, since we screened yours first, we'll just do it in order. Softball question, what inspired you to make a film about Mieko Shiomi? Did it start with the artist? Did it start with the art movement? Like, how did that come about? Oh, okay. Uh, okay, thanks everyone for watching it. And, and thanks for the question. So um, I shot this film in uh, 2019 to early 2020. And that was right after I came back to Tokyo from New York City where I learned filmmaking and I actually um, joined a um, fintech firm to you know, support myself and I was like in my free time I was making short films and after like joined and started to work uh, um, after I joined uh, the company and started working I, I figured out how gender um, the, the gender inequality in the world, like um, in school, um, female and male students were like 50-50. Um, but when I went to the company, most of the executives are male. And I kind of knew, but I, re I realized again in the company. And then when I visited museums and, and um, film theaters, most of the directors are male. So I started to think about gender inequalities in society and also in you know art industry or film industry. And then I started to go into workshops or um, workshops or seminars. 
And then I met a um, group of young female um, artists, music uh, composers. And then I, I told them that I'm a filmmaker and I'm thinking about making a film which, which was themed about gender inequality. But I was not sure what I was going to you know, make. But then they, they actually, the group was um, thinking about the same thing actually. Like they wanted to do an interview for um, female artists who could survive in, in, you know, in this like male dominated um, art industry. So we were like, okay, let's, let's do it together. And then that's how I met um, Shiomi, the, protag the protagonist of this um, shadow piece. Sorry, it, it went long, I went long. Uh, no, we love long answers. That is so, so interesting. I love that you were able to kind of find a community to make this film with. That's super, super cool. So yeah. then how, so you mentioned how, I feel like it's very common where young people, especially young women, as we're coming into adulthood, we're starting to kind of see the world a little bit clearer and starting to fully realize our own place in it, right? Mm -hmm. So as we're coming out of high school, as we're coming out of university. So then how do you want young Japanese female artists to feel or react to your film? Um, so um, I don't, I don't have particular like hope that mm -hmm. um, you know how how my audience watched the film, but um, if I if I can have one um, hope that I wait, sorry, um, I think I want my audience to start think what should we what should we do or what we mm. should do to make um to make the the um, the world better place for us actually um yeah so shiomi did what she could do in her time but like yeah what we can do in our time is i think different and we ha I'm, I'm still looking for the answer so if the audience could start thinking about the answer with me that would be great <laughs> I love that. No, I absolutely love that. I think that's a really good point that for, I mean, you even say it at the end of the documentary, for each generation, we have our own strengths, our own pullbacks, certain things we can and can't do. So to kind of be pushing that envelope and to really be pushing for what we can do in our time, mm -hmm. I think is super important. Mm -hmm. You good? Did you have something you wanted to say? I noticed you unmuted. Oh, no, no, no. But a dialogue. <laughs> always good so you know I'm ready okay <laughs> all right I love it I love that you're ready <laughs> so I mean a story like this could be told in a myriad of ways why did you choose a semi-autobiographical documentary as your format hmm good question um I I like um so I made this film um two years ago but I thought um, the situation we were we were in for like these two years in this COVID time was I thought um, it was kind of similar to Xiaomi's where she, when she could couldn't go out as she wanted like and she needed to stack in the house so I thought the audience would, could connect themselves to Xiaomi. So yeah, that's why I chose this one. And also it was like 10 minutes. So I thought it was like, nice. Oh, that's so <laughs> interesting. So then kind of piggybacking off of that, one thing I really love about this documentary, I was saying actually before, is how personal it is, mm -hmm. how you are so involved in it, how it's not just about Miyako Shiomi, that you're also mm -hmm. so much, like you, like you just said that Miyako Shiomi is the main subject, but in my eyes, I more interpret it as you being the main subject, mm -hmm. as you being kind of the vehicle through which we get to experience this documentary. So what made you take this like very intimate approach to your storytelling? Okay, thanks for asking me <laughs> because um, I had zero intention to have myself in, in the documentary actually at first. Really? Yeah, so I was uh, about to, you know, have Sh Xiaomi 
and like just you know entirely Xiaomi's interview and you know she doing like creating creating something but um as um as I said, um, she kind of expresses um, anti-feminist views, uh, which yeah. is fine. But um, if I, I, I was a bit concerned if I just um, shoot her um, anti-feminist views and there, um, I thought it might be a bit discouraging for other female um, artists. Yeah. Uh, because- um, With no connection. Right, right, exactly. Because like she was, um, of course she did a lot of effort, but she was one of the lucky people who could get environment and also support. And but there were a lot of other female artists who couldn't have those, so she, who had to get give up, you know. Yeah. And yeah. So I didn't want my story to be just saying like, oh, okay, so this female artist could do this, so everyone could do could, could do that. It, you know, I didn't say that I didn't want to say yeah. that so that's that's why I thought I needed to put myself as an you know kind of um sub um, sub character yeah um, yeah I kind of wanted to um, put like two two main characters so I so the um, the audience could have the journey with me to yeah. learn about Xiaomi and also about, you know, about the um, history. Yeah, okay, that's super interesting. I also think with us going through you, it allows us to have a more sympathetic view of Miyako Xiaomi as well. I think it could be very easy for us to say, oh, well, she's, she's wrong, she's wrong, feminism is right, she's wrong, and just be in maybe shut down mm -hmm. and not want to kind of hear those views. But when we go through it with you, and we have this understanding of, okay, yep, the ideas are different, but hold on, let's still look at how she was able to come up. Let's still look at the adversity she faced and maybe why she's not thinking of it the same way that we are. I think taking it through then, we're able to kind of open up our minds a little bit, take a minute and be like, okay, these views are different, but I still wanna hear what she has to say. I still wanna learn a bit about her. So I think that was super, super interesting. So then you are both a director and arguably the main subject, maybe the secondary main subject of this film. So, okay, so you said that originally you didn't have this in mind, but there is still quite a bit of footage of you in the film. How did, did you then film that afterwards? Is that just some extra stuff you had that you, you know, in the editing process decided to add in? Like, how did that come about? Oh, okay, yeah, so I had, um, I sometimes um, shot by myself with, you know, with, my camera but sometimes I had cinematographer so when I went to see Xiaomi with the cinematographer he thought like my our communication was like in interesting so he shot a lot of footage with me and her together okay. and yeah that so in the editing room I could find those footages and I was like okay I'm you know just started inserting them okay Oh, that is so, so interesting. I just love how it all fell together so beautifully. That is so, so interesting. All righty. So we are going to hop over to Yuko now with There's China Tony. Questions, but okay, sure. Oh, yeah. do you want to ask Minami a question? <laughs> yeah, kind of interested in the title. Like, um, I feel like shadow piece, mm -hmm. um, you're kind of getting at the dark feminine or like the <laughs> the unsaid stuff and it's kind of rebellious itself <laughs> um you know was that intentional or um actually this title shadow piece is named after Shiomi's uh, um one of the art pieces of her right but um yeah we um yeah we we kind of um, wanted to put some nuance that she need what she needed to do and when she was living as you know like housewives and like when she needed to kind of you know hide what she's doing like when when she needed to do like kind of moonlit work yeah that yeah exactly you I think uh, you you read it right very interesting that was a great question thank you Yuko. so 
How they already you know. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, oh, yeah, I actually just yeah. don't want to talk about my film. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. You can go ahead and ask. Yeah. How did she react to the film? Or like, did she? Mm. You know, was there like a change in perspective? Like, did she? She must have learned from you. Mm. And mm -hmm. Your your work. So I'm just wondering. So yeah. Uh, overall, she liked the film. Okay. Um, yeah, she sent a lot of like her friends and you know her creative friends and people. But actually, like she told me that she didn't she didn't particularly want it, uh, me to tell her story from the gender perspective because like she believes she is just a human, not like a man, a uh, um, female artist. So um, she was not particularly super happy about it, but she was okay to have herself as the subject because she wanted to, she said she wanted to support young female filmmaker to make another film. And if she, and she thought like, if she could be the subject, uh, she was happy to do that. So it was kind of blessing from her, mm. from her for me. So yeah, I really appreciate how she kind of collaborated with me. Oh, that's wonderful. I think that's very interesting this for, for herself she doesn't want to be viewed through this gender lens, mm -hmm. but then also acknowledges that it's important to help female filmmakers specifically. So I, you know, I think there right. is kind of maybe that divide between how she views herself and how she views society as a whole, mm -hmm. gender issues as a whole, perhaps. I mean, I don't want to speak for her. I've never met her, but. <laughs> yeah, but it's a generational thing. Like when you talk mm -hmm. about feminism in, in Japan, like feminism is still such a borrowed term from the West. And it's kind of like, yes. where do we even approach this word? Like, am I a feminist? Like, it's kind of, uh, it's a tricky, sensitive mm. um, issue, I feel like. So. Definitely. Definitely. For us, it doesn't have the same meaning. So. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then do you, so a question for both of you, as Japanese women that have spent um, a good amount of time in New York specifically in the West. Do you feel it's easier for you guys to take on this term of feminist of to talk about feminism versus your peers that stayed in Japan? Hmm. Either of you can go first, doesn't matter. Yeah. Oh. Do you want to go? Go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, I think so. Um, oh, so many, so many thoughts. Go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, to me, um, like saying out loud that I'm a feminist, uh, like it was much easier in, in New York City and mm. than in, in Tokyo because um, like in, I thought in, in New York City, more, more people thought being feminist, feminist meant believing in like gender equality but in japan more people think like being feminist is more like um attacking male mm. yeah so yeah um, i think it's uh, the the context where the term feminist or feminism were used were different so yeah it's 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 not like which is good or bad but yeah like saying out that i'm a feminist was much easier when i was in new york city Mm. Yeah. I feel like here it's almost like breathing. It's not something so complicated or theoretical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it affects both men and women. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The same, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> I think it's changing though, even in Japan. Mm. I hope so. Yeah, fully though. I also hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. All right. The time has come. We got to know all about Chinatown V. So Yuko, what, I mean, again, we start with the, the simplest, broadest question. What inspired you to make a film about Corky Lee? Um, well, Corky Lee was uh, one of Henry Chang's best friends and he happened to die of COVID right before shooting. Um, and so he kind of creeped into the film um, so kind of naturally, he had to be in the film. Um, it was just so present in all of us. 
And I think also I've been a photojournalist, but like photographer living, um, covering events and things. So even though I didn't know Corky, I've, I, I wanted to kind of represent um, it in a different generation. Um, yeah. And so there was something um, I felt in correlation to Corky. Um, mm -hmm. But the film just kind of um, came in bits at a, at a time very quickly. Um, it started off as like more of a mood piece. I wanted mm -hmm. to see visually what Henry would look like at night in Chinatown. Um, and then it just kind of the dialogue of, well, then I would like to know about your creative process. And then he would write something back about, you know, maybe we could do this. And then maybe we could add a little bit of music. And, and then Corky passed away. So how does he incorporate in this thing that we're building together? Um, mm -hmm. So, and then it became about how do you represent a 70 year old Asian male who's not an actor, who doesn't, who's usually the one behind the scenes, um, but such a, such a hero, like a big figure in his community um, and so outspoken. So how do you represent this guy the way we see him? How does he want to be seen? Um, and, you know, we all want to be seen as, as cool and, you know, collected. And so me being a, an actor and always, this question of representation is always on my mind. So um, in telling this documentary, I wanted to kind of put my two cents about how we as Asian people want to be seen in the media. And mm. all these ideas kind of came and made the film, <laughs> so. I love that. I think it's, yeah, very interesting that we are talking about someone through his visual work but then also through his peers that remember him so fondly, because you're right. Yeah, if he's behind the camera, there's not, there won't be a huge wealth of footage of him. And you know, like I feel like with directors, we always have the pointies, right? So for those who aren't familiar, a pointy is, you've definitely seen it before. It is a picture of a director, usually behind the camera or next to the cinematographer, looking off of something in the distance, pointing. <laughs> If you watch any documentary about any director, you will always see that. It will always, always be there. So there's already, I don't know, this mindset of needing to capture those who are behind the camera in film, but not so much in photography, which I think is very interesting. But I still think the way you went about it of kind of bringing in other people really brought him to life and really allowed us to see his visual work, his photography, which is very cool. So I think that's going to touch on a bit what you said earlier, that it was a community piece, which I thought was a very interesting way to put it. I've never heard that before. Can you talk a, a little bit about that, how this is a community piece? Um, well, we were all stuck in New York City during COVID. We couldn't really leave. A lot of us um, couldn't afford to leave, you know, we were kind of stuck inside, uh, not knowing what to do with ourselves. Um, and I think we really need each other, especially as artists living in this capitalist world to, to nurture that, that, that spirit. And so when a friend approached me saying, Hey, Yuko, do you want to do a night shoot? immediately it was a yes and then yes came, became oh let's involve Hen Henry and then let's involve yeah. Corky and Perry and everybody that came on board so I think for me community is important in our survival as artists as 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 a as a member of community to teach and learn about each other and I think it's beautiful how it, how that could happen intergenerationally. Um, mm. So I really appreciated Henry on kind of like being on my level. He could have been very much this, this uh, you know, ancient sage type of guy, but he was kind of like, all right, this is exciting. All right, no yeah. more? Okay, then I can write something. And I'm like, really? And none of this was, you know, 
paid or anything um, when we yeah. made it. So that kind of spirit is something that I would like to pass on to younger generations. And, you know, that mm. attitude that Henry has is something I would always want to have as an artist. So. Oh, nice. That's so wonderful that he was just so about it. I love that. Yeah. So something I want to ask. So like, we, again, you're hinting at a little bit. What is your personal connection to Chinatown, New York, especially as someone of Japanese heritage? Yeah, um, for me, I'm definitely, um, you know, an outsider in that I don't speak the language, I don't live there. Um, I visit whenever I want to and I can get out. It's not the same mm. for many people. Um, but I guess it's, it's um, the art, artist community there are really, really sophisticated and really um, have a long history of making things um, and mm. are really supportive of young artists, um, regardless of whether you are Chinese or not. Um, mm. So I kind of um, equate it that way. Uh, I'm, it's a, it's a community I appreciate who appreciates mm. me, hopefully, so. Oh, I love that. <laughs> That's so sweet, I absolutely love that. So you spoke a little bit about this starting as a mood piece and that is so evident. It is so stylish. It is so, it's got vibes. It's got vibes all throughout. <laughs> The score in the background is such a prominent piece of that storytelling. It really, it sets that tone so quickly. It takes us there, it holds us there the whole time. Can you tell us a little bit about the song, how it was chosen and who composed it? Yeah, Perry Young, he's also an actor. He's an actor, a musician based in New York and he was a really good friend of Corky Lee's. And so when Corky died, um, Perry just like shared his um, flute music on, on Facebook and stuff. And I just wanted to kind of seep that energy in that even though Corky was no longer, he, he was still evident in the music, in that, mm. in that swirl of flutes sounds yeah. as Henry like walks through the, the nights of uh, Chinatown streets, so. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So then, I think we might be circling back to community here, but uh, Henry Chang presented this idea of street as family in the beginning of the film. And that was one of the pieces of di like dialogue that really stuck with me from the beginning and then kind of stayed in my mind as the rest of the film was being presented. Can you explain a little bit what he meant by this? Yeah. Um, well, you know, the one of the, people that made the, this film, um, a guy who worked behind the scenes, who provided yeah. us with, you know, he gave us his apartment to shoot in and things. Um, he was also a really good friend of Henry's who recently died like two weeks ago. And, mm. you know, he was one of the OG members of the Chinatown community as well. And like, just like, just the trust and uh, respect um, these guys have for each other. Uh, that's that's not something you can buy. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not something that you got to earn it, you know? Yeah. And I think that's what Henry means by like street, like that's the, it's thicker than blood because you yeah. through it, through the generations. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and it's something we can envy and learn and try to create on our, on our own as, as younger artists. Absolutely, very cool. So, okay, so I have a few questions for the two of you. Before I hop into those, Minami, do you have anything you wanna hop in with? Oh yeah, can I ask you a question? So I, I love the um, Beatles feeling in, in this um, documentary because like he's talking about something that is gone and yeah, and that bittersweet feeling was like um, emphasized with the sound design, which I love. So um, for example, like New York City 
street sound when was on the title card. And like, I, I kind of, I, I, I loved it. And I wanted to ask like, how did you tackle uh, with um, sound design? Um, I think sound design is actually one of my favorite parts of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, and so that mood and that energy that I want to bring is always music. Um, I think it's just as important as the images. So, um, yeah, how it came about, how it came mm -hmm, together, yeah. that question. Um, just vibing. <laughs> just, <laughs> just COVID times, just being in real, real time, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, while making it, this was how I was feeling. So mm. uh, it just felt appropriate. Um, mm. I don't know if that is. I feel like that's a good thing for our, for our audience members to know about you, you go going forward, that you will call you an auditory filmmaker. You are very much about the sounds. So I think as, since we're all fans now, obviously, and they go in to watch your other pieces, they should watch that with that in mind, knowing, okay, Hugo is all about the sound. Hugo loves sound design. She wants this to sound crisp. She wants the music to be tight. To know that going in, I think, is going to be very interesting for audience members going forward. Yeah, because sound is just so emotional. Um, mm. So, yeah, definitely. Part of the awesome, design. Awesome. Yeah. Minami, do you have any other questions? Oh, yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask, like, how was the reaction from um, Cha Cha Henry for this um, oh. country and maybe, like, fam family or friends around him? Did you get a chance to hear their um, reaction to this film? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I've talked to people, um, like Henry's fans, um, and Henry's friends who's, who've read like all of his books. And one of the questions, uh, one of the comments I got was that I was able to capture something about Henry that's um, so evident in all of his books. So it was mm -hmm. like, um, not just him as a person, but as, as, a, as, as the vibe he creates in his books. So mm -hmm. that, was, that was quite cool. Um, and then Henry, I, I, my goal was to present it on his 70th birthday, which was February 2nd. Um, and I was kind of a few days late, but um, I, I showed it to him and yeah, he was happy. He's proud. Yeah. So then for Henry's fans, who had they up until his documentary essentially only known him on the page? Had they only read his work and not gotten to hear his, his voice before? Um, he's actually, he has another film coming out, um, based on okay. one of his novels. Yeah. And it's a narrative short. Um, so okay. that's coming out very soon. And, you know, he's always got projects going on. So I think he's got some stuff happening on, for TV. Um, he's got short, he's got a lot of stuff happening. Um, okay. Yeah. Cool, but cool, I cool, definitely cool. feel like he belongs, he's so charismatic that I definitely. felt like he really belongs in front of the camera. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so I was super psyched that I was able to capture that. And he's got the voice for it too. Like as he was like reading the poetry, I was, I, he's got the voice for it. Definitely. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. And one thing I don't, uh, I haven't captured in the film is he's one of the funniest people I, I know. And really? Yeah. He's like a total New Yorker, just so loose and so cool. And so if I were able ever to work with him again, I'd want to capture his his comedic side. Oh my gosh, that's so funny! All right, yeah, I would love. I mean, yeah, let's hear his stand up. Like, <laughs> we want to hear those jokes. <laughs> Yeah. All right, yeah. so let's hop into the questions for the two of you. So both of your films are centered around influential artists. If you were to make a document, I mean, you can, you can answer, sorry, but if you were to make a documentary about another artist, a, a different artist, who would it be? And that, that's a question for both of you. So you go, since you're unmuted, you can go ahead first. Another artist? Yeah. Um... There's a couple people I'm actually trying to reach out to. 
Um, Ooh, are you allowed to yeah. tell us? If not, no worries. Mm, maybe not. Maybe not. No. Yeah. Um, okay. So but if you guys want to know the answer to this question for Yuko, you're going to have to keep up with her. You're going to have to follow her and see what ends up coming out next. <laughs> Minami, what about you? Okay, um, I don't have any plans now, so I think I can just say my, you know, kind of my dream. But um, I love um, another female artist named um, Shigeko Kubota. Um, mm. she, um, Moma has m many of her works and yeah, she was in New York City for, uh, she, she lived in New York City and her husband was Nam Jun Paik, um, another like media artist. And um, she was, um, she was like friend of Xiaomi actually. And really? she came to, they came to New York City together, but then Xiaomi decided to move back to Tokyo, but uh, Shigeko decided to stay in New York City. So, oh no, uh, mm -hmm. Xiaomi went back to Osaka, but anyways, yeah. So I kind of want to learn how, you know, how Shigeko decided to, you know, choose another path as um, an yeah. artist. So yeah, it's my dream, but I have no plan to do that. Yeah. Oh, very cool. That's a, that's a good one. That's a good idea. Start this series just with all their <laughs> friends. <laughs> Yeah, it's my like, very yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. So then, oh, sorry, Yuko, did you have something to say? Oh, like just kind of the web of these people. How we're <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> Start working yeah, out I was here. actually curious, like, why did you choose um, Xiaomi for, like, you could have chosen other people, I'm, I uh, suppose. Oh, uh, actually, um, Xiaomi. So the community I was working with had a um, connection with Xiaomi. Got and it. actually I have, I have been to her exhibition and I liked Fluxus before. So I was like, oh my God, if I could interview Xiaomi, that would be perfect. So it was like, yeah, perfect um, opportunity for me. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So then we have filmmakers in our audience who are trying to figure out how to make their own first short, or for some of them, maybe even their first feature film. So for you two, what was the biggest challenge or lesson that you've encountered thus far in your filmmaking journey? <laughs> you go, I'm going to you first, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still learning how to ask for what I want. And mm. um, you just have to ask for what you want to get what you want. Um, with, whether that's money, whether that's uh, a certain collaborator or a certain, um, you know, whatever it is. Uh, and not be afraid to ask for what you want. Because again, we go back to like being a woman and everything. I mean, you know, coming from the Japanese um, culture, like being a director could sometimes be uncomfortable. Um, and I hope to just kind of unstigmatize that aspect mm. of the bossy, the whatever, the, the you know, authoritarian or whatever it is. Um, yeah. yeah. It's only bossy when we do it. When the men do it, it's great leadership. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yes, you are so, so right. <laughs> yeah. you know, and also, I think, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, go um, ahead, you go, my bad. I think also to um, just like walk towards the void, like walk towards mm. the unknown and just do it. <laughs> um, mm. Because that's where the good stuff is. So oh, yeah. I don't think you need to know exactly what you're doing, but just to have faith and trust and walk towards the void. Um, mm. So those are the challenges. I love that. Mm. That was very poetic. That's a poetic note to end <laughs> it on. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, go ahead, Minami. Yeah, actually, Yuko got the, all, all the answers. <laughs> I really love her 100%. Yeah. Um, I think um, if I, I think it's, um, I, I'm, I'll be piggybacking, like, um, going towards the void thing. But, uh, but yeah, like, enjoy the collaboration with other people because, yeah. like, we can never make films by ourselves. So, yeah, and um, enjoy the collaboration and, like, see and appreciate what other people put, you know, in front of you. I think that would be, yeah, that would be, um, I think it's what I'm like enjoying when I'm making films and 
So that's great. I think it's. I love that, especially fun. since you two had such collaborative films, both of you. I feel like that is a great note, a great note to have to embrace that collaboration. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All righty. So, in celebration of International Women's Month, for those who aren't familiar with the industry in Japan, what is your take on the progress or lack thereof for Japanese female filmmakers? You go. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, in a way, it's a. It's. I mean, I think many things. Um, it doesn't have to be female necessarily, but like now there's a Japanese filmmaker nominated for several Oscars at the moment. And I wonder what that would do for Japanese filmmaking in the world. Um, mm. Whether like, you know, other opportunities as actors, as directors, do we, uh, would there be more money in the industry? You know, I wonder how that would um, affect filmmaking and also like, Japan has a rich history of women in film that like yes. I'm only discovering now. Um, like this woman, I don't know, Minami, if you know, Tanaka Kinuyo. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and there's, uh, there's a retrospective happening at the Lincoln Center um, oh, this wow. month. And there, she's made like so many films, um, but how come I didn't even know about this woman until now? And I think that speaks to a lot of women out there too. So I think as, as female filmmakers, it's, it's essential that we bring other people up as we hopefully rise up um, yeah. and support each other um, because we could only be the change that we want to be. So, yeah. Very nice. And Minami? Yeah. Um. So the I recently I recently see some changes in Japanese film industry. Um. Um. One of them is some um community started doing the research on exact numbers of like female and male directors uh, whose films are um, screened at like um, and job, um, like um, what, what is it? Uh, cine, cine, cinema complex, like the big theaters. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. it's really important to, to show the data of like how gender, um, how, how the, um, how in, in echo, in, in echo, the film industry is, and like they are also trying to um, um, uh, show the num numbers of of like um, they are trying to uh, uh, so um, everyone knew that um, um, filmmaking environment, the film production environment in Japan was not good. Like everyone was like leave it, like um, some people like left. Uh, needed to left the production because they they haven't slept for you know days and they couldn't yeah. they thought like it's too dangerous so but um everyone knew it was it should be changed but they didn't they didn't know what is the reality like we mm -hmm. they didn't have the exact data so some of the community started to have the data first so they can start thinking how the the strategy or like how to change it so I think the change is, is happening. Very nice, it's very nice. Alrighty, so I'm gonna go ahead and open the floor to audience questions. If you see me looking to the side, it's because I'm reading those audience questions. <laughs> so everyone go ahead, submit your questions while we're waiting for them to type away on those keyboards. I do have a question, one more question for the two of you. What is next? What should we be looking out for? in terms of, you know, projects you have coming up, anything like that, what should we be, be watching out for from the two of you? Um, I am, um, yeah, I, I'm writing my first feature film. Um, it's a um, feature narrative um, that themed um, sisterhood. <laughs> and it, mm -hmm. I will have like three female protagonists. They have different, um, you know, life in, in different parts in, in Japan. Mm. And I would like to depict um, the fight 
or not it's not like fight but like how they um try to achieve their goal um in in their lives and i i hope to depict um female protagonists uh female characters with authenticity so yeah that's my what i'm trying to do next oh i love it oh we are so excited for that one awesome <laughs> awesome awesome and you go we already know you have a documentary on the way yeah um i'm working on a feature my first feature doc um and it's about uh should i just say it i guess i should why not if you're allowed to yeah we'd love to know yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> Um, so it's about um, Fusako Shigenobu, who is uh, the former leader of the Japanese Red Army. And uh, she's been um, someone who's been fighting with the Palestinian Front for um, from 1971 for like three decades uh, with a secret daughter. And she was captured by, um, you know, she was kind of seen, you know, as a freedom fighter in one part of the world and a terrorist terrorist in another part of the world um and so she was captured by the japanese police in 2000 and she comes out in uh this may so um my team and i are working now in capturing who this woman is and kind of undoing her narrative because everything that's been said about her um you know she, she's been in prison also um, she hasn't been able to defend herself in or um, identify herself in the in the light that uh, she she may have wanted to. So um, yeah, so I've been working with her daughter and her as well through uh, letters in prison, and she's just an incredible, intelligent person who's you know been through everything. Like she was born right after the war, so 1945 till now. So what does, what can her experience teach us? How has the world changed? How has it progressed in some ways? Has, has it regressed in some ways? Um, and it's not just, it's about her politics, but it's also about her radical family that she's created. Um, her daughter's half Palestinian. Um, she's, a, she's a journalist based in Lebanon, but uh, the bond they have is just beautiful and yeah it's it's a story not many people know about um that I think people should know about so um yeah so I'm still in the fundraising process so hey <laughs> I know right um okay so I've never heard of this before but this is so interesting I cannot wait for that I already have so many questions about that but that's that I can't do that now <laughs> But afterwards, I've got some questions for you. <laughs> wow, that is so, so interesting. All right, hold on. So let's check out these audience questions. Oh, wow, okay, the, both those projects sound so, so interesting. Let me see. All right, we have a, there's a lot of comments. There's definitely... Okay, so here we have a question for Minami. <laughs> What the comment says, when I was watching Shadow Peace, I was really looking at the protagonist as being your shadow, like your darker feminine side. Mm, interesting. That is interesting. Okay, but then, but you said it was really about one of her pieces, so I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if my theory is a little correct. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, thanks. For is there a oh, little okay. correct, or, or is that just coincidence? Oh, uh, actually, uh, I think... I, it's an actual coincidence. I didn't um, see the protagonist as my like shadow um, at all. But um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoy I really enjoy reading this comment. It's really interesting. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Mm. Let's see. There's, okay, so give me one second. There are there's some there's some comments to sift through here. I love it. I love that we are. The, everyone is interacting in the comments. Do we have any more audience questions, y'all? There's plenty of comments. The questions is what we're here for, fam. I have a question for you, Minami. Oh, um, oh go for it. 
Yeah. Do you have like, what's your writing process like? Do you have um, like a writing collaborator or do you write solo? Do you research a lot or do you, are you intuitive? Do you have like a set schedule? You know, do you work at night, morning? Oh, well, that's what I uh, want to, I, I, that's what I wanted to ask you. Like, how do you research? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I, I do set the um, deadline, like, I, I set deadline for myself, like, oh, okay, I'm gonna finish act one by this time. And then I just, you know, start writing. And I so, I do I do some interviews. For example, I have, I, one of the, the main character is um, um, mixed race, like half Japanese, half French. So I asked like some, um, some of my friends who have like different, you know, who have, one of the parents from another com country so I kind of trying to um, you know research first and then write but I think uh, I just finished first draft so and I always think screenwriting screenwriting is rewriting so I'm sure I'm gonna you know rewrite again and again and again yeah how about you? Do, do you write for your documentary or like do you do a lot of research first? Yeah, I do a lot of research. Um, for this one, I was originally thinking of doing a narrative. Um, so I have um, dialogue and I have like a narrative story about her life um, that comes from my research, but I think in a way I also function as like an actor kind of figuring out the character as mm -hmm. if I were playing the character. So kind of, I think, um, uh, I, I feel like sometimes I talk to um, the daughter of uh, Fusako Shikinobu, Mei, Mei-san, like I ask her kind of these kind of odd questions that maybe to her, it seems not, has nothing to do with um, with the narrative, of the overall narrative. But for me, as an actor, I'm kind of see seeking, trying to push buttons in a way that would unlock it for me. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I approach it as like that. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I wish I could write like you know, like you, like like have a deadline and do. <laughs> <laughs> have a like a full script and everything uh, the approach from to to you know documentary and and um narrative is a very different i mean some of some we have the they have similarities sometimes but yeah 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 which which are you more comfortable in um mm, i like both they, they're so different so yeah yeah <clears throat> Yeah, it's like writing uh, for documentary, I write in the editing room, you know? Like, mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I do That's it. an interesting way to put it. I like that. <laughs> All right, so we do have an audience question for Yuko, and then we'll ask my final, final question. So I do think this is running a little long. This conversation has been so good <laughs> that we are just not even paying attention to time. We could be here for another six hours. But I can't do that to you too. So here we got Yuko's question. <laughs> so another audience member, they said, I feel as though Chinatowns are very similar all over the world. And there are many Chinatowns, of course. Yuko, do you think this is a universal representation of all Chinatowns globally, or is it very NYC? So I guess they're asking about maybe the themes presented in the film. Do you think those are things that you can attribute to all Chinatowns or is it New York, like uh -huh. NYC specific? Yeah, I mean, there are certain things about like immigrant culture that we all kind of really can relate to um, that might come across in my film. But I think it's very, um, very New York Chinatown and also very time specific to that COVID era. Because like, mm. if you look around, like there's no one around Henry. He's just on, like we shot and there was nobody on the street. Um, yeah. And that wouldn't really happen usually. And yeah, yeah. Okay. Very cool, very, very cool. Alrighty, so we've heard about your upcoming projects. Everyone is officially a fan. 
how can the viewers find you? What are your social media handles? You have a website. How should people be keeping up with the two of you so that they can be first in line to buy tickets to whatever's next? <laughs> Yeah, I have Instagram and I have a website. Um, are there any ways for me to? Well, it's um, definitely, we'll definitely have it in description, but go ahead and just say it anyway in case people are sitting there with their phones ready to type it oh, in. For sure, yeah. It's, my Instagram is um, min51030 I'm going to put it in the chat, actually. Okay. The chat on YouTube, right? Exactly. Okay, good, 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 good. Perfect, perfect. And you go, how about you? Oh no, and Minoi, what is your website as well, actually? Oh What's yeah, website? I'm gonna put it. Okay, perfect, perfect. And you go, how about you? Yeah, um, my website is my name, .us, and nice. uh, my name is my Instagram. So very easy to find. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice and simple, nice and easy to find. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for this super amazing conversation, for sharing your films with us, for taking the time for us today. We super appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, it was so fun. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah, oh, definitely. And I love I love the conversation between the two of you. I love that you guys are asking each other questions, like just so, so great. So for the fans watching, you guys know how to find these two lovely filmmakers. Our next short film Saturday is on March 19th with a Colombian filmmaker, Victoria Rivera. We are continuing Women's History Month. All, for all our short film Saturdays this month, it's all women the whole time. Love it, love it, love it. Don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe so that you don't have to remember when this is coming on next to so just automatically get a notification. So hit that notification bell as well. And again, thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, depending on yeah, where you are, everyone's so everywhere. <laughs> Very cool. Bye-bye. Thank you.